Navajo have not always been a tribe of herdsmen. Long ago, a warlike nomadic people came from the north and settled in the plateau country now known as Arizona. They quarreled among themselves and separated, becoming the Apache and the Navajo. These warlike tribes used to raid their more peaceful farmer neighbors, the Pueblo Indians, seeking food. But when the Spaniards brought sheep to the southwest, the Navajos gradually turned from war to herding, an occupation suited to their wandering life. The Spanish influenced the Navajo in many things, as in the scarf this boy carries as he drives the family flock to graze. Today, sheep herding is those chief sources both of food and of income through trading of wool and the famous Navajo rugs with the white man in exchange for machine-made cloth and store supplies. The Navajo people have greatly increased in numbers since they first came into the Southwest, and even after being placed on a reservation are one of the few Indian tribes still growing. Although we know they were intruders from the North, their origin myth tells that the first clan of the Navajo was created by the gods in Arizona or Utah about 500 years ago. The Navajo called themselves Diné, which means simply, the people. Although they are not farmers by tradition, the men raise corn plus some beans, squash, and melons. A Navajo man is far from lazy. He must cultivate the crops, herd cattle, and haul water from the nearest spring or stream, often five miles from his home. In this arid region, the corn must be planted deep to reach the damp earth, and a number of grains are sown together to shield the inner stalks from the hot sunshine and dry wind. The Navajo woman has an unusually high social position and great influence. She is sole manager of the Hogan, a lodging made of logs, branches, grass, and earth, often so low that one must stoop to enter the doorway, and the average man cannot stand inside. A woman's life is a busy one, and cooking is one of her endless duties. An Indian child is never considered too young to observe, and help his elders at work. You may think it odd that jewelry is worn while at work, but you will always find a Navajo wearing turquoise in some way, as they believe it gives them protection from lightning, snake bite, and all forms of evil. Cornmeal is made into several kinds of bread. Your mother would use a muffin tin, the Indian housewife shapes the dough like this. The cornbread is placed under the coals of an outdoor fire and baked thoroughly. Cornmeal dough is also baked in round loaves or made into flat pancake-like tortillas, which are fried in mutton fat. These are a hospitable people. They take pride in always having food on hand when a guest drops in. The Navajo used to make crude pottery in which to cook and serve their food but now find it more convenient to use the white man's metal pots and inexpensive dishes. The children have pets of all kinds. The puppy is this small boy's companion and toy. This child is too young to have acquired the patience which we associate with his race, and he decides a push will help the dog make up its mind about eating. As the boy grows older, the father is responsible for training his son. Archery, which was once used as such an effective weapon, is now more or less a pastime. Reaching the age of seven or eight, the Navajo boy is able to ride a horse and herd sheep. He is often given a few lambs as the start of his own future flock. Even if he is sent to a government boarding school, his parents will care for his sheep. And when he returns to the reservation, he will no doubt become a shepherd, as his people have been for over three centuries. When we hear the word Navajo, we immediately think of the Navajo rugs and blankets, which have become world famous. Navajo women probably learned the art of weaving from their Pueblo neighbors. 
but soon surpassed them in it. The first articles were made of wild cotton, then growing in northern Arizona. After sheep were introduced, the women began experimenting with the wool, and the resulting blankets were so finely made that early white explorers described them as waterproof. The wool is carded with two metal brushes, which arrange the fibers evenly and remove sand, burrs, and loose dirt. The wool must still be washed to remove all oil so that the dye will take. After carding, the wool is spun into yarn by twisting and winding the fibers on a spindle-like stick. Though the Spaniards brought the spinning wheel into Mexico, the Navajos never copied its use. The yarn has been spread out to dry after being dyed. This woman is winding the yarn into balls, ready for weaving. Besides sorting the natural wool colors of creamy white, tan, and dark brown, Navajo women early invented a number of plant and mineral dye processes. However, the white man's commercial dyes were so much easier to use that the old methods were, until recently, almost forgotten. The setting up of a loom is a tedious process and the father, husband, or brother may be called upon to lend a hand. The warp is the first threading to go on the loom. It must be strung with great care, for one mistake at this stage will follow the weaver all through the rug. Now the loom is set up for weaving in the cross threads, called the woof. Though the design elements are based on mythology, the pattern of each rug is a new invention created and carried in the weaver's mind. The first design was credited to the spider woman, who warned the weavers to leave a small hole or other evil spirits, or the weaver would become dizzy. For many years, this superstition persisted, until the traders refused to pay as much for blankets. Thereafter, perfect blankets have been made, such as the one we see here. Making silver jewelry is the work of the men, who rank among the finest silversmiths in the world. This art was learned from the Spanish, probably by way of wandering Mexican craftsmen, and the silver itself was never mined by the Navajos, yet there is no more characteristic Indian craft product than the jewelry which has been developed by the Navajo tribe. This thing a Navajo Indian enjoys more than driving a good bargain, and a trip to the trading post is a family outing. The trader depends on his reputation for fair dealing, and much of the Indian's opinion of all white men is based on their experience with this one representative of the white race. He must be licensed by the Indian Bureau, and his dealings with the Indians are regulated by laws. <laughs>